Hey guys, welcome back. So now we're jumping back into Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals with the Death to the Mutants tie-in, part one of three, with this first issue taking place at the same time as Axe issue two. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so for this one, we get a closer look at some of the events that had taken place in the background of Axe issue two. And it starts off from around the time where we saw Tony, Cersei, Sinister, and the others split up and gather the necessary components to put together this new god. And when it starts off, we begin following Cersei, who we had seen make her way to Lemuria, the deviant capital city, to gather with the Eternals that still side against Druig so she can tell Fastos what he needs to do and make her way to the Haunted Abyss with the others so that they can gather the testimonies of the Slaughter, which is supposed to be like a component that the Celestial needs for it to awaken with both knowledge of light and dark, because otherwise it would probably just wake up all happy and goofy. And that's not what they're trying to do, because it's not love alone that makes a Celestial's heart beat. But from here with Cersei making her way to the Eternals, first she lets them know like, yeah, I've been consulting with the Avengers and we got a plan which as we know is really the situation with her getting kidnapped, interrogated, and eventually talking it out. But with her breaking this down and showing them the blueprint, and informing them that she's working with a team of humans as well as a mutant specialist to create this new god using the celestial of Avengers Mountain, and rather quickly, Fastos is like, hey, I, I got a question. And really, it's here where he goes off on Ajax and Makari, because in Eve of Judgment, issue one, they had approached him with this idea. And though at the time he told him that he was against the idea of kidnapping this mutant expert because early on it would make the mutants their enemies and likely start a war before the war, but with them having this conversation, Fastos did let them know that their whole idea was possible. And really at that time, that's all that Ajax and Makari needed to hear because prior to them even seeking counsel from Fastos, they had already taken matters into their own hands and they had already kidnapped Mr. Sinister. And I like that in this time, we at least cover his reaction to discovering this because in the main series, it moves kind of fast and it really just brushes over the fact that he'd had to know this information at some point. And upon discovering it, he definitely would have said something to Ajax. But at the same time, that's what the tie-ins are for. But this doesn't go on for too long because for one, Fastos really can't say anything because he's the guy who just brought back Thanos not too long ago. So there's that. But really from here, they just keep it moving because kidnapping Sinister hasn't brought about consequences just yet. And the construction of this new Celestial is priority. But on top of that, the reason why Fastos switches gears and he's like, okay, just tell me what I need to do. It's mainly because one, the damage is done and this plan seems like it will work. But also for Fastos, because so many lives were lost with him trying to destroy the machine in order to save the humans, it has him at a point to where he's ready to do whatever he needs to do to atone for that. And it's from here where they make their way to the Haunted Abyss, the bowels of Numeria, where in this particular location, a ton of deviants were slaughtered by the Celestials during the second host. But also this is where Cersei needs to do her ritual to get the testimonies that she needs as part of building this new god. But also normally the Eternals, they wouldn't have access to this place because to the deviants, this is considered one of their more sacred locations because also during the second host, this is where the Celestials had struck first. And for the Deviants in Lemuria, they had always looked at this place as a reminder of the exact place and moment where they had learned that the gods don't love them. But with them getting access to this place and getting what they need, they were able to do this because Cersei had asked Thena to ask Crow, with Thena being much closer to Crow, and I mean much closer, and Cersei knew that Thena would be able to talk to Crow and get them access. Even though he'd be taking a risk by doing this, because again, many of the deviants see this place as a sacred spot, and he would have to answer to the others if they knew that he let the Eternals step into this place where the gods lashed out. But from here, Crow tells Icarus that with them getting what they need to fight Druig and the other Eternals, that this is more or less gonna put a target on a deviant's back. And Icarus gets that, and he tells Crow that it doesn't change the fact that what Druig is doing is wrong. And his hero Crow then tells Icarus, like, hey man, I'm not trying to tell you not to do what you're about to do, but instead, just don't let them know that you did it. Because if this event's gonna turn into Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals versus Deviants, and I mean like Deviant Deviants, not just Mutant Deviants, since the mutants are deviants now, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. But what Crow is actually saying is that if him and the actual deviants are gonna get involved in all of this, they rather do it because of their own actions. And with leaving, Crow tells Icarus, why not do something out of character? Be clever. And so it's here where Icarus gets an idea, which from here takes him to the subspace tunnels to holler at Gilgamesh the Forgotten in order to get access to more stealth suits so that Icarus and the others can pay Druid a visit. 
And in the case of Druig, at this time you still have the attack that's going on in Krakoa, as well as Arako. And at this time, Druig is monitoring the Hex as they attack Krakoa, as well as monitoring Zerus, who's carrying out the Unimine attack on the Quiet Council of Krakoa. And while this is going on, we're given a bit of a description from the machine as far as how Zerus and the Unimine stack up against Charles and the other mutant psychics. And with the way that the machine explains this, it compares it to a game. And it says that the mutants, they do more damage, but the Eternals, they have a lot more hit points. And I'm not really sure how that compares as far as RPGs. So if you're an RPG expert, you probably help me out in the comments. And let me know what exactly hit points are, because I don't know nothing about that. But on top of this, just as a bit of context, we also find out from Juick that this is about around the time when Sign, the member of the Hex, was getting ready to be redeployed, which like we had seen was leading towards the end of Axe Issue 2. And it's from here we then head over to the Exclusion, where we start to see the plan of Icarus go underway, with him, Gilgamesh, and a couple others going in stealth mode so they can get the drop on Kalos, the destructor of the Oceanic Watch. And Druid didn't make security too tight because he didn't believe that he needed to because he didn't think anyone would be crazy enough to sneak into the exclusion or let alone attack Kalos. But when Icarus and the others do, Kalos, he spots them early. But when he brings out his six-headed Hydra construct, he doesn't notice that one of these guys just slipped by him undetected. And it's here we find that Sprite has slipped in a temporary override, blocking access to the armory to where then Icarus destroys the console so that Druid can't access the armory anytime soon. And as soon as this is done, it's here where Magic and the others make their way in. But it's from here where Icarus and Gilgamesh, who are still in stealth mode, they then go and make their way over to Zerus. And man, while Zerus is here defenseless, they do him dirty. But at the same time, I don't feel bad about it because he's attacking the Quiet Council with the Unimine, like, so whatever. But it's here with Zerus where they teleport a portion of his brain temporarily into another dimension. And it's not a significant amount, just enough to incapacitate him. Because with doing this, they're not killing Zerus. Because if he died, he would just come back. And on top of that, a human would have to die in order to bring him back. But in the case of Druid, with him seeing this attack and seeing what happened to Zerus, he's then like, you know what? Unless something else happens, we can still win today. And he's telling Domo more or less like, hey, we got this. But then it's here in this moment when something else happens. Because right at this moment, Fastos is putting the finishing touches on the new god. And like we'd seen when this thing came alive, everything stopped and took heed everywhere. With it giving them the whole speech about you have 24 hours to justify yourselves, like we'd seen towards the end of Axe Issue 2. But also at this time as Icarus and Gilgamesh make their escape, Icarus leaves one last message for Druig to see. And he literally burns the writing on the wall, which is a quite biblical move, but also to be expected from Icarus. But in this case, it's for Druig and not King Belshazzar. Because the writing reads, Death to the Eternals. Which from here, this will give Druig a bit more to think about as soon as he sees it. But by the time that he reads it, Icarus and Gilgamesh will be long gone. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so you can go to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And we'll do it again on the next one. Alright, later.